Okay, the red light is on. We are recording. So I said, when it comes to all of these wonderful things, the principalities, the powers, the thrones, I think that the thrones are the key to what these are. This follows a pattern of Jesus. He will give you a clue. He'll give you a breadcrumb. And then you follow the breadcrumb and you see the pattern. And then that pattern applies to all the rest. This is a technique that Jesus uses. It is Semitic education. It's not Greek based education. It's not American Western based education. In our Western culture, we expect somebody to trot out all the answers for us that we're supposed to memorize and the people who can regurgitate the information best get the A's. They get the best grade. But in Semitic education, learning was earned and you had to demonstrate wisdom in order to get more. So the uh, Semitic educators would give clues and encourage the students to pick up on the clues and follow them. So it was more active learning than just reception. You had to get involved and follow it through. And Jesus taught that way. You can see it in the Sermon on the Mount and in other places, like in the parables. Somebody will ask Jesus a question, and then he'll list two or three responses to it. And those two or three responses are talking about the same thing, but looking at it from different perspectives. And one of those two or three will have a clue in it. And if you follow that clue, then you'll see the pattern That applies to the other examples and how you can see the unity of what he was trying to explain. I think that it is the case with this, with thrones. They are the key that unlocks what the other things are. The principalities and the powers and the dominions. So, what are the thrones? Well, the Greek word is thronos. They imply positions. It's for those who are seated. And what are they seated for? They're seated for judgment. They're seated for counsel. They're seated for rule, like kings sit in thrones. And the book Revelation gives us a fascinating glimpse into the throne room of God, where this position in the spiritual hierarchy is mentioned. Now, see, I'm saying it's spiritual hierarchy because the adversary has principalities and powers and those same terms, see. And so I think that those were the decimated portions of the ranks that were cast down that have not yet been filled. And so here there are thrones. Of course, God's throne room is symbolic. He's omnipresent. He inhabits eternity. So there's there's not some place out in the universe where his throne is. Um, Sorry, there there is this one picture from the Hubble telescope where it burped or something. And it has this fantastic looking smear that doesn't exist. It's just a mistake in the photograph. But it looks wonderful. And people say, that's where heaven is. No, it's not that. (laughs) I imagine if you've seen that picture, you know what I mean. But the throne room of God, this is a symbolic thing. It's communicating certain aspects that they want communicated. But in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, talks about these thrones. Revelation chapter 4 Verse 4, it says, round about the throne, God's throne, were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So there are twenty-four elders sitting on thrones. So there's twenty-four thrones. Okay? 
God has a throne, Jesus has a throne, and there's 24 thrones. So there's 26 thrones altogether, right? Revelation 20, verse 4 is another reference to it. But we'll, we'll go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 for the next use here. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. It says, The four and twenty elders fell down before him, God, that sat on the throne, and worship him that, that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So, who are the twenty-four elders? that are on the thrones. I think we know who 12 of them are. Believe it or not. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Verse 28. Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration. He's talking about the 12 apostles. Ye that have followed me in the regeneration where the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, here are twenty-four thrones. Alright? And they are going to be judging. Look at Revelation 20. I skipped over that. Revelation 20 verse 4, it says... And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. Alright? So, these 24 thrones, judgment is given to them. Well, that's the same thing that Jesus is saying for 12 thrones. So, half of the 24 are the 12 apostles. Minus Judas plus Matthias. Okay? So, I think that these 24 thrones are occupied by born-again believers after the gathering together. Revelation chapter 4 is right at the beginning of the vision. Because Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, the voice says, let me take you up to heaven and into the hereafter. So, Revelation chapter 4 is the beginning of of a second vision. The first vision is Revelation 1 where John sees Jesus with the stars and the seven candlesticks and all of that. Okay? That's one vision. Revelation chapter 1 through 3. The second vision is begins with Revelation chapter 4 and that one definitely future, hereafter. Hereafter what? I think it's hereafter the gathering together. See? In order to understand eschatology correctly, there are certain principles that you must have right. You must believe that Jesus is not God. Because if you believe incorrectly, you'll misinterpret parts of the book of Revelation and get your eschatology wrong. The next thing that people need to understand correctly is administrations. You have to understand that there are dispensations, administrations in the word. There are time periods. And what's fascinating is every single one of the time periods begins with audible words that come out of thin air. Every single one. Words. Very interesting. And then, the next thing is the great mystery. That's part of dispensationalism. It's the cornerstone of it. But there are prophecies in the Old Testament that do not apply to us in the church that people think apply to us in the church because they don't understand the mystery was hidden see those things in the Old Testament many of them are still in the future talking about things that happened in the 6th administration and then finally in order to get your eschatology right you must understand that the dead are still dead until they get raised in a resurrection The dead are not alive in heaven now. The only one that was dead and is alive and is in heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you understand those four doctrines, then your eschatology can be correct. 
you still can screw it up, <laughs> I guess. But you'll be getting rid of most of the error. So, who are these 24? I think that 12 of the 24 we know. They are the 12 apostles. After the gathering together, they're sitting on 12 of the 24 thrones. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. It talks about these same 24. See, understanding the thrones will help us understand what all the rest are. Those things that were created in Colossians chapter 1. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the Lamb, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So that's another function of the twenty-four elders. Very interesting. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou, the Lamb, art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Whoa! They just identified themselves, didn't they? Okay. Who are redeemed? Us believers, right? And, not just Jews, that's Old Testament, that would be the Jews, but out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. See? That's why I think that these 24 elders are born again believers after the gathering together, and they have crowns of gold. That's another crown. You know, we were taught that we had five crowns, No, I believe there are seven crowns. (laughs) The crown of gold is one of them. The extra one. Gold is the very best. So, just like the twelve apostles were the very best, I think the other twelve thrones, 13 through 24, are going to be occupied by born-again believers of the same stature. The very best. I mean, I'd give Martin Luther one of those thrones... The Apostle Paul, okay, maybe Billy Graham, I don't know. We're not assigning the other 12 thrones. God's going to do that. But they're born-again believers. Okay, isn't that fascinating? So, the occupants of the thrones have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ from every kindred. So they're not just Jews, there's some Gentiles there. So, these are born-again believers. The thrones are occupied by believers. And of course that fits with what we've seen in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. It says the saints are going to judge the world. Okay? Now, can 24 elders judge billions? Okay, well, there's going to have assistance to the judges, right? And there's going to be secretaries to those assistants. And there's going to be adjutants to those secretaries to those assistants. And assistants to the adjutants to the secretaries to the assistants. Okay? There's going to be hierarchies of believers judging the world. One of our deployments in the gathering together is going to be to judge the world. Alright? To judge like the judges did back in the book of Judges. It just doesn't mean that they presided over trials. No. They ruled. They helped with the administration of the kingdom. Right? So that's what we're going to do. That's going to be one of our deployments. Wow. So we're going to judge the world. One of the other deployments is judge angels. Boy, that will be a good one. But anyway, so those are the thrones, the four and twenty elders, and I think they are believers. Now, back in Colossians, these thrones were created. I believe that they are the missing positions that fell, that now are recreated, either by God or by Jesus, doesn't matter which one, but it talks about in Colossians, for by him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones, okay, elders or tribunals or thrones, or powers, those are lordships or dominions, or rulers, those are arche, or authorities, those are exousia, delegated positions, appointed positions. All things were created by him and for him. So, whether Colossians 1.16 is speaking of Jesus as the Grand Vizier, being granted the powers of creation to make these, or whether God did it, all right? Power certainly came from God to do it. This throne echelon was created, past tense, in Colossians. It happened when Jesus ascended to God's right hand, all right? But it won't be occupied until after the gathering together. Say, that's what these things are. They're, they're part of the all things. And the all things were, they were given to him at the ascension. All of them. It wasn't like part then and part later. All of them were given. So that's why I'm saying, these thrones, they're unoccupied right now. But in the future, they're going to be occupied. And who are they going to be occupied by? Believers. So that's why I believe that us believers, originally Adam and Eve were supposed to be the progenitors of a race of believers to replenish the earth. That didn't work out very well. We are going to complete that job. That's what I think. Woo! (laughs) And so Jesus was given a position far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. But it also said in Colossians that these are visible and invisible. What's that? In heaven and on earth. What's that? Well, since we know who 12 of the thrones are going to be occupied by, Like I said, the thrones give us the clue. So, the people, the apostles, they were visible on earth. Right? So, their down payment, their earnest, included something that ultimately would end up on that throne. That's what I think that visible and invisible are. Okay? (laughs) So, that's what I know about the creation. Jesus is the firstborn, the R.K. of creation. We could cover a bunch of other stuff on this, but I want to move on because we have to cover... (laughs) There is just so much to teach. There is just so much on this. Once you start looking at who Jesus is and not who he is not the vistas open up it's just amazing how we used to be talking about who Jesus was not and that was a negative thing and that's all we did but when you talk about who Jesus is and what he's doing all this opens up so the next thing in our list about the attributes of God is God is the first cause The first cause. Now, this fits with what's called the cosmological theory, where the universe had a beginning. Well, we even the scientists say that their observance of the universe with all of their fancy telescopes looking further and further and further out from us can see further and further back in time, basically, because they're seeing light that has traveled from billions of years ago that's just arriving at the Earth from fantastic distances. And so they see what the, what's changed from far away, and they can see the beginning. So, if it had a beginning, the cosmological theory is... It had a cause. God was the first cause. See? Every chain of causes goes back to God. Now, this term first cause was used by Greek thinkers 
and it became an underlying assumption in the Judeo-Christian tradition because of the influence of Greek philosophy. So, God is the first cause. Is Jesus that? Well, John chapter 5, verse 19. It says, Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. So does that sound like a first cause to you? No. But what he sees the Father do, the Father is the cause. For what things soever he does, these also does the Son likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may make marvel. So, Jesus is not the first cause. Also, Jesus called him Father. That shows the same thing. The Father is the cause of the Son. Right? Next one in the list is self-existence. Self-existence. In Rene's work, Rene Fretz wrote, by self-existence, we refer to that unique attribute of God by which he has existed eternally and will always exist so, unlike all other aspects that relate to our existence. God does not owe his being to any other thing. I know, I owe, Renee says, my existence to my mother and father and my ancestors. Then he says, my computer owes its existence to IBM before they sold the laptop division to the Chinese. (laughs) And our earth owes its existence to God, who through whatever means and processes he saw fit, created the world. All events have causes. All right? All creatures have been created, except for God. God is the uncaused cause. He's the uncreated creator. Like Jesus who himself was created, God was not created. God did not depend upon anything outside, anything external to his own nature. He has the ground or his existence in himself. God is independent in his being. He's independent of everything else. Acity is a term. It's a Latin term meaning of oneself. It's used of God to denote that he exists in and of himself, independent of anything else. He is self-existent. So the biblical basis for God's acity is found in the facts that he existed prior to and independent of the creation and he brought into and sustains in existence everything else that is. These are quotes. That last one I gave you was from Geisler. Uh, for Augustine says, God is absolute being, and therefore all other being that is relative was made by him. No being that was made from nothing could be on par with God, nor could it even be at all were it not made by him. A.J. Tozer says, So lofty is our opinion of ourselves that we find it quite easy, not to say enjoyable, to believe that we are necessary to God. But the truth is that God is not greater for our being, nor would he be less if we did not exist. That we do exist is altogether of God's free determination, not by our desert, nor by divine necessity. Some of the verses that go along with this. Isaiah 40, verse 15. All the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, 
Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. See, he gives to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and found him, although he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain Paul said of your prophets, your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. For as much then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. See, it's like (laughs) he made the world, he's not worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything. John chapter 5 verse 26 says that he has life in himself. Okay? So that's that self-existence. But on the other hand, Jesus was born. Okay? So his existence was because of his father and his mother. Mary was his mother, God was his father. God created life in Mary. So, he was Mary's firstborn son and God's only begotten son. Now, the translators, just so you know, they try to say that only begotten, mono genos, only begotten, means to be only one of its kind. If you plug that in, that meaning to into all the meanings of that, it doesn't fit. See, Luke seventeen twelve, when Jesus was come nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. Well, monogenos, it does not mean the only one of his kind, the only son of his mother. That doesn't fit there, does it? She was a widow, and much people in the city was with her. Luke 8.42, talking about a man who had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was laying dying. So, and a one only daughter, monogenos. It means only begotten, doesn't mean only one of its kind. Uh, Luke 9.38, And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child, monogenos. So, he's Mary's firstborn, but God's only begotten son. So that meaning of only one of its kind does not fit. The only begotten fits. See, Jesus was born. He had a beginning. Next trait is sovereign, sovereign. The sovereignty of God is the Christian teaching that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. He is the sovereign Lord of all and he is the creator. Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45 verse 5 and 6, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee as thou though hast not known me. They may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Of course, there's that famous verse in Exodus where God says, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. See, he's sovereign. He doesn't depend upon anyone else. He has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. When it comes to the Son, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28, it says, When all things shall be subdued unto him, unto Jesus, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, unto God, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So, Jesus is not sovereign. You see? Jesus is not sovereign. Next one we want to cover is light. Now, (laughs) to really understand this, you'll have to listen to Rene Fretz's presentation 
in the one God of original Christianity. I think it's session eight. <laughs> It'll blow your mind about the octaves of light. It's just amazing. But similar to the phrase, God is love, God is light. He is spirit. He is the word. So love, light, spirit, and the word are the things that the Bible says that God is. These are his His very essences. God is light. It's a transcendent trait. But this light here is not the light that is made of photons. Because when he said, let there be light, it was before the stars. This is the kind of light that the God is the father of. He's the father of lights. John chapter 1, verse 4. John chapter 1, verse 4. It says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that comes into the world. So this kind of light is truth. This kind of light is not physical light made out of photons. It's a different kind of light. See? Very interesting. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is another occurrence. Talks about this wonderful light that God is. James chapter 1 and in verse 17 every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning so God is the light and then we are the lights of this world so we get our light from him the same thing happened with Jesus Jesus got his light from God see he's he's the father of all lights that includes the light of the natural world the sun, the moon, the stars everything shining in heaven also the light of spiritual wisdom God's love the light of his law the light of prophecy that shines in that in a, a dark place the light of the gospel that shines throughout the world the light of the apostles all the different people who have stood uh, the light of the Holy Spirit shining in our hearts the light of the Lord Jesus Christ the light of the world so he's the father of all of these different kinds of light when when God said let there be light in Genesis 1 3 he saw the light it was good and then he divided the light from the darkness this division of spiritual light from darkness is not the same as the division of day from night that occurred later so you see there's there's different kinds of light very interesting so um Let's look here. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 21, talks about the new Jerusalem. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it and the city had no need of the sun neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it 
and the Lamb is the light thereof. So, a different kind of light. This is going to be in a different dimension. See, different rules. We're going to be spiritual beings like the angels are. See, verse 24, And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. So this this is what the new heaven and earth is going to be like. Verse 26, And they shall bring glory and honor and, and the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So one of our deployments is we'll get to go there. But what's interesting is, see, God is light, and Jesus now is the light of the world, but then, look at what he'll be in verse 23. Again, it says, The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. What is that? We're just going to have to see. We're going to have new eyes to see it, too. So, the last thing I want to cover is the word God is the word and now this is interesting let's go to John chapter 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 these are all the traits on the infinitude side what God is and what Jesus is John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God The same was in the beginning with God. Well, what does that mean? (laughs) Very interesting. Some of our, our friends say that you put this together with verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, verse 14 of John chapter 1 is talking about Jesus Christ. And so, they say, well, if God was the Word, and the Word was made flesh, then God was made flesh. That's what they say. It's like they say, it's like the associative law of mathematics. If A equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C. Okay? Well, that's compelling however when it comes to math you have x y and z you have a b and c they're just simple symbols but words yes they're symbols but they're more complex symbols than just a simple a b or c and so there's different rules for putting words together that are more complex and this is This is not the associative law of mathematics when it comes to words. This is what's called a syllogism. S-Y-L-L-O-G-I-S-M. Syllogism. And so there's rules for this. So if I wanted to state something in the form of a syllogism, Americans drive cars. John is an American. Therefore, John drives a car. Now, is that true? Well, not necessarily. But if I said, all Americans drive cars, John is an American. Therefore, John drives a car. Would that be true? Yes, that would be true. Because of the word all. So, in a syllogism, the middle term has to be distributed that's the terminology for it. You have to have a sense of all there in order for the syllogism to be valid. So, when it comes to Jesus and God and the Word, okay, God was the Word, the Word was made flesh, therefore God was made flesh. 
That's not necessarily true. There's not enough information there. If it said, God was the Word, all the Word was made flesh, therefore God was made flesh, would that be true? Yes, that would be true. So our question is, was all the Word made flesh? Okay, if all the Word was made flesh, then Jesus would know everything, right? Well, in Mark 13, 32, Jesus himself declared something he did not know. Mark 13, and in verse 32, well, we begin verse 31, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knows no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So there you have Jesus saying he didn't know everything. Therefore, all the word was not made flesh. When Jesus was in the flesh, he was not all the word. Is that clear? Because he he said he, he didn't know something. Well, if he didn't know that, what else did he know? Okay? <laughs> also, when it comes to this, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, how can the Word be with God and God at the same time? All right? <laughs> Let's take that out of the spiritual and just put it into the physical for a moment here. I'm going to hold up a piece of paper. You can't see it, but I'm going to hold it. See? Here's my piece of paper, right? So, how can this piece of paper be with this piece of paper? It doesn't make sense unless you have two pieces of paper. Okay? (laughs) This piece of paper was with this piece of paper. Okay? That makes sense. There have to be two pieces of paper there. There's two kinds of word. So what this does is it makes it, if A equals B and C equals D, there's there's no associated law, there's no syllogism there. Okay? Because there's two different kinds of word. And it doesn't really matter. It says the word was with God and the word was God. Okay? It doesn't matter what preposition is there. The word is was God and the word was from God. See? Or the, the word was God and the word was to God. The existence of the preposition means there have to be two different kinds. But this particular preposition is pros with the accusative. All right? And you can look this up in Thayer's lexicon. See, Thayer's is really good because it splits out all the different occurrences of the different meanings and it analyzes things. And there's a lot of different traits that can produce different meanings. So when it comes to pros, there's a bunch of occurrences where pros is used with the verb to be. Okay? And so, like for example, Jesus said one time, Oh, wicked and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Alright? The word was with God. Same construction, the verb to be there. And it's pros with the accusative case. How long shall I be with you? So, was Jesus part of the wicked and perverse generation? No, he was together with it, but he was independent of it. See, Bollinger gives that definition for the preposition pros. One of the options is together with, yet with distinct independence. So, here you have two kinds of word. One kind of word is the word that was God. Okay? Well, what is word? A word is information. It's a concept. So, 
God was the word. God knows everything. He is omniscient. He has foreknowledge. So it follows that if God is all-knowing, then he is the word. He knows everything from the infinite to the infinitesimal throughout all eternity. All right? God is all the word. Then there was a, a second kind of word that was made flesh. Jesus was this personified. Jesus spoke for God. He talked to people about salvation. He taught about God. And God revealed to Jesus a lot of information, but not everything. And so, in the beginning, God was the Word. He knew everything by foreknowledge. Yet, together with that, but independent of it, in God's foreknowledge, was what ended up that Jesus personified. He was the Word made flesh. If you look at Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine, it just it shows you the two kinds of word. Take a look at Deuteronomy twenty nine verse twenty nine. It says the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Alright? That is the word that God is. Everything. Everything that can be known about everything. Okay, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So God, in his foreknowledge, knew and knows everything. Yet within that vast amount of information was another set of information that was to be revealed and it was to be revealed why so that we'll be able to do what we need to do we'll be able to do all the words of this law we'll be able to perform our obligations what god wants us to do so that is john 1 1 very simply in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god you see there's two different kinds of word there jesus embodied the revealed word he spoke for god see now in our one god of original christianity class i spent a lot of time talking about exodus 314 and what it really meant and what the ramifications were of the misinterpretation of that verse and one of the ramifications was that it opened the door for Greek philosophy to encroach into Hebrew thought. And this idea from Greek philosophy that produced the Logos doctrine that I explained to you earlier, where the doctrine of the immovable mover that was so perfect that that, that God could not move, And so then they sort of painted themselves into a philosophical corner there. Whenever that happens, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to rethink your assumptions. Well, they didn't want to do that. They made a trap door in the corner. (laughs) And they said, well, there is this intermediary being that God used to create the world. They called this, this intermediary being the Logos. But they never explained where it came from. Well, I mean, to create that would be a huge change. (laughs) <laughs> so, but they never explained that. So anyway, when Greek philosophy contaminated Christian thought in the 2nd and 3rd s- centuries, this Logos from Greek philosophy became the Logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. No, I think John was writing John 1.1 1, 1 long before anyone ever thought of this in Christian thought, in original Christian thought, say. I think it was long before that. It had nothing to do with the Logos. That was the true word. See, Now also, there is an idea in Judaism about the word. In mystical Judaism, they believe that wisdom is personified as a divine agent. Well, 
that again is just Greek contamination. That Greek contamination in Judaism actually began with the Septuagint translation of Exodus 3.14. I am the being one. And I explain the ramifications of that in the one God of original Christianity. I don't have time to cover that all now. So in Jewish thought, some of them think that the word is a personified agent and where do they get this from go to proverbs proverbs chapter 8 proverbs chapter 8 we'll just cover this briefly here it says doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice she stands in the top of high places by the way in the palace in the places of the paths she cries at the gates at the entry of the city at the coming in at the doors unto you O men I call and my voice is to the sons of men O ye simple understand wisdom and you fools be ye of an understanding heart hear for I will speak of excellent things and the opening of my lips shall be right things for my mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. And all the words of my mouth are in righteousness, and there is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understands, and right to him that finds knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. So what these people who are trying to intermix Greek philosophy and Hebrew thought do is they say that this wisdom is the personification, it is the logos that Jesus was. Well, wait a minute. In verse 12 it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. So it seems that prudence is someone else. Is is, is it a, a quartet and not a trinity? Um, see, all this is, is a figure of speech. It's a personification. <laughs> and if you read through Proverbs chapter 8, it personifies wisdom. But it also personifies a second thing, and that's the other woman. The other woman is the opposite of wisdom in Proverbs. So this does not fit with the Logos doctrine and the idea that wisdom is a living thing is intermixing Greek philosophy with Hebrew thought. Well, If Jesus is the Word, then what is he? Well, we've seen some of the things that Jesus said. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. He is the Word made flesh, yes, but also now that he has arisen to God's right hand, what is his relationship to the Word then? Well, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, revelation of Jesus Christ. That's a genitive case. There's many different kinds of genitives. And so for a while, I could not tell definitively which genitive case it was until I saw Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he, Jesus, sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So, God gave the word revelation to Jesus 
Jesus gave it to the angel, and the angel spoke it to John. So, you see how that explains Galatians, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. The epistles came from Jesus to Paul. Okay? That's how it works. Jesus revealed himself to Paul. And it it says this in Acts, Acts chapter 26, on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to Saul. Jesus told him that he was going to talk to him some more in Acts 26 and in verse 16 Jesus said to Paul to Saul but rise and stand upon your feet for I have appeared unto you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of the things in which I will appear unto thee all Jesus told Paul he was going to talk to him some more well what did they talk about I think that Jesus taught Paul the content of the epistles. Okay? And we've covered a bunch of this before in some of the other classes about all the things that Jesus has told Paul. Well, here, here's an example. Uh, Romans, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Verse 14. Paul says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Well, when did Jesus tell Paul that? Had to be during these conversations that Jesus told Paul were coming. And it says, I am persuaded. That implies some reasoning, right? It implies a conversation. It implies back and forth. Okay? So, there's verses like this all over (laughs) in the epistles where Paul indicates that he learned what he learned from Jesus. Why? Why? Because Jesus is the Word. Alright? The Word made flesh. You see? And that's how he fulfills that. So, that's all we're going to cover tonight. These are the traits in the first column of all the traits of God that God gave to his Son. He gave to his Son as much as he could so that Jesus could do his job, which is sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. In the next session, we're going to be covering the middle column and go through those attributes and show what God had and what he allocated to Jesus in the Pleroma. So, bless you.